the NATO alliance, in the abstract, I can see the argument that it's a good thing, but in practice, what does it actually do to us, right? I mean, I, I believe that Montenegro is one of the recent additions to NATO, okay? And there's this, this, this bipolarity, this two-sidedness to the agreement once you get into NATO. So the United States is now committed to defend Montenegro, and Montenegro, you'll all rest easy tonight, has committed to defend the United States of America, okay? Um, does that actually make any sense, especially in a world where Germany still doesn't spend, even, I think even now, given what's happened the last couple months, still doesn't spend 2% of its GDP on, on defense? No, it's kind of a joke, right? At the end of the day, uh, NATO can be a useful alliance if NATO members actually do the things that they're committed to doing. Uh, and until they do that, let's just all be honest with it. Let's be honest with ourselves that it's not actually serving an especially useful function, okay? Um, the, the thing that I find so preposterous about this whole Russia-Ukraine situation is NATO will admit to you, right? Like, we're being more hawkish on Russia in the, in the UK is maybe the sort of the one exception actually in Europe than the Europeans are. Right? Some people wonder, can you uh, still believe in a policy of restraint? Can you still be someone who believes in less intervention? Can you have a realistic foreign policy in the midst of watching what's unfolding in Ukraine? Many of the folks who believe in restraint and believe in less intervention, you know, know by heart the words of John Quincy Adams when he said, America does not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. But I think an important part of that speech, which he gave on the 45th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, an important part of that speech precedes that statement about not going abroad in search of monsters to destroy. He also said, that where the standard of freedom and independence is unfurled, there will our hearts and minds be, there will our prayers, our benedictions be. So I think if John Quincy Adams were here today and he were asked about Ukraine, I think he would stand with many of us in not wanting to send troops, not in wanting to be directly involved in the war. But I think also, I think his sympathies would be with the aggrieved party, with the Ukrainians who have been attacked with uh, opposition to the aggression of the Russian army. So I think that is sometimes confused because if you stand up and say, well, yeah, you know, I don't want to get involved in this war, or if we're going to be involved in war, we have to be involved in a constitutional fashion. You know, Congress has to vote on these things. People immediately think, and they think, oh, you're on the other side. You actually are sympathetic with the other side. And I think there are a few who have shown sympathy for the Russians, but I think the vast majority don't. I have no sympathy for Putin, for what he's done, no justification. But it doesn't mean because something terrible in the world has happened that we throw out the baby with the bathwater, that we throw out our principled beliefs so that we no longer believe in the restraints of a constitutional foreign policy. All of the principles we have still, I think, stand. But if you're asking, have the circumstances changed? Is there some sort of uh, aspect of foreign policy that changes depending on the facts? Of course there are. Kissinger looked at this situation back in 2014, and he was asked about Ukraine. It was about the time of the Russian invasion. And his point was, he had three points basically, he said Ukraine ought to be free to decide what type of government they want for themselves. They ought to be able to free to associate economically or politically with any, any uh, association, west or east, and that they should not be part of NATO. And the thing is, is now people are like, oh, well, you want to say that it shouldn't be part of NATO. It's a little late for that, isn't it? You know, Putin's already invaded. Well, it is and it isn't. I mean, you've already seen that there are discussions, right? In the newspaper, they're reporting that Zelensky's talking about neutrality. So it really isn't something that's a done deal. The problem with making or having this discussion is people immediately, or at least the Internet trolls on Twitter, immediately think your sympathies lie, you know, well, it was okay that he invaded because they're not in NATO. No, it's not okay. Nobody's justifying the invasion, but we still should look for cause and effect and try to determine, is there a way out of this? It's one of the reasons I've objected to, we won't name any names, Lindsey Graham. It's, it's one of the reasons... I've objected to intemperate remarks about assassination or, you know, chopping the head of this, off the snake or even President Biden saying we've got to have regime change over there. The problem with it is, is I think people do need to be thoughtful in what they say because the other side hears this as well. And almost all war ends in negotiation. 
I mean, we see our history and we think everything is Japan. They either think it's everything is 1938 in Munich or they think everything is the end of the war with Japan and we dictated absolutely the terms. But most wars don't end that way. So if you tell your opponent, even if the opponent is the aggressor, that when the war is over, you will be drugged to the Hague and then you will be hung by the neck until you're dead, it makes them less likely to ever want to stop fighting. And it doesn't justify the aggression, but the thing is, is I think we do need to have an off-ramp or an exit that's available even for our enemies, even for the people we disagree with. Pride. It was a, it was a blow to their pride to, for the Soviet Union to dissolve. But at that point, instead of expanding NATO, we should have, you know, worked to build bridges with them. But we didn't. And so that's what sort of brought this upon and um, it was totally unavoidable, and there were a lot of sages at the time who, who said this was unavoidable. Let me, there was an article by Eric Black, and he quoted someone who was called the architect of America's successful containment of the Soviet Union. This, this gentleman was uh, George F. Kennan. He said, and this was in the 90s, I think it's the beginning of a new Cold War. This is about the expansion of NATO. I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely and it will affect their policies. I think it's a strategic mistake. There was no f reason for this whatsoever. No one was threatening anybody else. The expansion would make the founding fathers of this country turn over in their graves. We have signed up to protect a whole series of countries, even though we have neither the resources nor the intention to do so in any serious way. NATO expansion was simply a light-hearted action by the Senate that has no real interest in foreign affairs. What bothers me is how superficial and ill-informed the whole Senate debate was. I was particularly bothered by references to Russia as a country dying to attack Western Europe. So Kissinger and Kennan, they, they told us that this is where we would end up if we insisted on doing this. I wanna talk a little bit about NATO and this gets me into, because it gets me into the next topic I want to talk about, which is Congress has the authority, the sole authority, to declare war. And this also means to, to make acts of war. And everybody's always trying to find a loophole to exploit. But I believe that NATO is obsolete. NATO became obsolete when the, when the Soviet empire fell. And expanding NATO you have to, the people who advocated for that have to take some responsibility. I'm not saying Putin's not responsible, but you have to accept some responsibility for doing things that led up to this. And um, if I could, we would dissolve it tomorrow, at least get the United States out of it. This notion that American taxpayers should be conscripted into the defense of, of Europe is ridiculous. Look, also, if, if we believe if we believe the media and that this small country of, of Ukraine has single-handedly held off the entire Russian military successfully, then why do we need to subsidize Germany if, to protect them? I mean, surely they are at least as competent as Ukraine. It's my belief that the war in Ukraine could have been prevented. Asserting this in no way implies that anyone other than Vladimir Putin is responsible for starting this war. He ordered the invasion, and the blood spilled is ultimately on his hands. But just because his actions caused the war doesn't mean it was inevitable or that we couldn't have taken steps to prevent it. Years ago, a number of academics, albeit ones not favored by our foreign policy establishment, predicted a future crisis in Ukraine that would wreck that country. If a war is predictable, shouldn't it also be preventable? There are two ways to prevent conflict, strength and diplomacy. Consider the American eagle that's depicted on the great seal of the United States and that appears on our dollar bill. In one talon, the eagle clutches 13 arrows. And in the other of its talons, it clutches an olive branch. The founders were trying to tell us something. This reflects our nation's understanding of how to make and maintain peace, strength, and diplomacy. This administration has failed on both fronts. First, President Biden failed to project American strength when he gutted our energy independence on his very first day in office canceling the Keystone Pipeline, and restricting domestic energy production. Meanwhile, other NATO countries like Germany made themselves even more dependent on Russian gas by shuttering their nuclear power plants. Putin must have concluded that the West needed his gas too much to sanction him effectively. Next, the administration botched the withdrawal from Afghanistan. 